DJ Metal Craig of Craig's Metal Storm here. I have one of the members of Fifth Angel with me today. Hey, how's it going? And would you like to introduce yourself and what position you do in the band? Sure. My name is Ken Mary. I'm the drummer and also producer. And I'm one of the original members from the band. And we've been together for, well, on and off for almost, well, I think 38 years now or something crazy like that. Right on. This first question is a real good one. Please go back in the history of Fifth Angel and how the band all got started. Well, uh, Ted, Ted Pilot, the original singer, Ed Archer and myself uh, played in bands since we were kids. Uh, they actually caught me at a junior high talent show and uh, asked me to be in the band and, and we did some playing around as a local band and then uh, they actually hooked up with James Bird I think in 1983 and uh, we all got together and, and recorded the first album I believe it we recorded the demos in 1984 and then did the uh, full album full-length album for the self-titled in 1985 it was quite a, quite a time. We recorded it at Steve Lawson Studios in Seattle, Washington, which is now Bad Animals, which is owned by Hart. And uh, we had a great engineer, a guy named Terry Date, who actually went on to, uh, this was his first album. The, actually, the Fifth Angel album was his first album ever, uh, pro producing and co-producing with us. And he went on to produce uh, bands like Pantera, Soundgarden, uh, Deftones, so he went on to produce, you know, many multi-platinum records. So that was his first record, and this was Steve Lawson Studios in Seattle. And we were very young and full of spit and vinegar, but we really wanted to craft an excellent album. We were very determined to to make it great. We wanted the songs to be great. We wanted our performances to be great. We wanted the mix to be great. And uh, here we are, all these years later, still talking about it. <laughs> right on. How did you guys come up with the band name, Fifth Angel? Well, that was actually Ted's brother, Matt. Uh, the band was looking for a, a name, and his brother was going through, I think it was like a class on theology or something. So he was having to read Revelations. And he told us, you know, hey, there's some really cool uh, names in, in Revelation. So he went and got the book, and he opened it up. And so we started going through these different angels, and we were thinking, you know, like, well, first angel, yeah, that doesn't sound very good. Second angel, that doesn't sound good. You know, you, you just count through them and you go, by the time you got to the fifth one, you went, oh, that sounds kind of cool. Like fifth angel, that sounds cool. So it stuck and it just was chosen because it sounded cool. <laughs> cool, man. Just so you know, uh, this next one is a bit of a challenging one. Who designed the fifth angel band logo? The original logo, I want to say it was an artist at Shrapnel Records. Um, I'm not sure who that would be, but that was the logo that I believe they did on the original uh, recording, which was, I think it went out on Shrapnel in 1986, if I'm not mistaken, and Roadrunner Records, which at the time was a very small little label in the Netherlands run by a guy named Sace Wessels. And Roadrunner now is a massive metal label. They have bands like Slipknot and tons of, of huge metal bands. So, but back then they were just like a little fledgling label. And but they did have CBS distribution. So, the, the, that's the first two albums, or excuse me, that's the first two labels that we were released on as a, as basically an independent product at that point. Right on. Who's all in the current lineup, and what instruments do they play? Well, we've got Ed Archer on rhythm guitar, we've got John Macko on bass, and myself, and we're all original members of the band. We also have a singer, Steve Carlson, who's been with the band since 2018, and he's just a you know an amazing powerhouse singer, extremely talented. We've got Ethan Brosh, who plays live with us and co-wrote a couple of the songs. We've got Jim Dovka, who played on um, played lead guitar solos on the album. And we also have a uh, friend of mine, Steve Conley, from the band Flossum and Jetsum, who helped out on this record um, doing some rhythms. There was a point where uh, Ed had an injury to his hand and really couldn't play, and Steve stepped in and, and uh, did some great work for us. Right on. Is it okay we could meet, you could go back and do a classic that I know from the first album that's a personal favorite of mine? 
Wh which song did you say? I was th thinking of having you talk about the music concept for the song Wings of Destiny off the self-titled album of Fifth Angel. Sure. Well, if you look at all the Fifth Angel albums, they really kind of do uh, talk about the just the state of mankind. And we, we were talking about things back then like war and terrorism and betrayal and, um, you know, so many topics that are still relevant today. But Wings of Destiny is a song about war. And it talks about how, you know, as a society, we take our young, we take our are, you know, they're basically children, you know, I mean, more or less. I mean, I know that they're, you know, obviously 18, but, you know, just barely out from being a minor and, you know, we're sending them off to war to die. Um, and so that song is actually kind of a moody piece that talks about uh, some some soldiers that are that are having to go and, and fight and 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 possibly probably not win. It's like fighting a losing battle. So that's that's what that song's about. Cool. How did you guys come up with the album title When Angels Kill? Well, it's it's kind of hard to describe how. Um, I, I think when I was writing that song, I think I was thinking, you know, people always think of angels in a good way. They always think of angels as, you know, my guardian angel. And this angel kept me from falling off this bridge. And this angel kept me from getting in an accident. And, and so, you know, it was kind of like a, a, a turn on that, you know, like, well, at one point, you know, angels will be, you know, will be here for destruction. And so really it was the, it was the idea that angels are, are now here for a different purpose. And that was, that was really where the, the title came from. But I don't, I don't know if there's anything that I can think of specifically that spurred the idea. Um, if that was your, what your question was, I think you were, you were saying, how did you come up with it? And that's, you know, it's, it's just like any piece of art. I think most artists will tell you, you know, how did you come up with it? Well, you know, they, they don't know. I mean, because, you know, as an artist, you're just trying to, you know, feel something and create something. And, you know, sometimes you don't even know what's going to come out. And, and so it's not like you can sit down and plan it. I was just talking in an interview today and I said, well, it's not like you're going to sit down and you're going to go, okay, I'm going to write a great song at one o'clock and then I'm going to write a, another great song at three o'clock. You can't schedule these things. I usually get my ideas at like two in the morning or three in the morning. I'll be like asleep and then all of a sudden I'll wake up and I'll have some idea or whatever that, that really inspires me. And I have to go grab my phone and sing the idea into my phone and, <laughs> and all this. And I'm, I'm always thinking to myself, well, why couldn't I come up with these ideas at like eight or nine in the morning or maybe seven o'clock at night? Why does it have to be three o'clock in the morning? So, uh, but you know, you create creativity comes when it comes and you just have to have to take it. And then you also have to see what comes out and if you like it and if it moves you and if it does, then, then you have something, but, uh, but yeah, I can't say there was anything specific that spurred that title. I understand you there, man. I have the same issue. Some of my ideas come from me late at night because I have insomnia. I'm a musician myself. Great. I'm probably the DJ. But I'm we'll so get on to the next question as well. How did you guys come up with the album art for When Angels Kill and who was used to design it? Well, actually, it was an artist named Andy Pilkington out of the UK. And he's done a lot of work uh, with Flotsam and Jetsam, which is another band that, that uh, I'm in. And um, he, which by the way, I'll show the album cover right here. This is the album cover. This is the vinyl, uh, When Angels Kill. And that's the incredible artwork that uh, Andy did. And the interesting thing about the artwork is it really is something that captures the idea of the record because, you know, you have the good angel on this side and, you know, the destructive angel on this side. And also it tells a little bit about the story. There's a character in the story uh, who is the love interest of the main protagonist. And she ends up being, she looks like an angel, but she's not an angel. And the story kind of goes bad. I don't want to say too much about it, but it's a, it's the love interest. Uh, the love story does not go well on this record. So it is a concept record. And we did weave together all of the different um, concepts and ideas, and sometimes even bits of lyrics and song titles from previous albums when we, wove them into a cohesive story for When Angels Kill. And it's 70 minutes long. 
It's a double vinyl. And uh, I think it's really, you know, quite an epic record. I mean, I, I'm looking forward. I don't have a turntable yet, but I'm looking forward to getting a turntable, sitting down, uh, taking two different nights, because I think it's a, it's a, it's a two-listen album. I think you have to divide it into two albums. Uh, the first one you listen to one day, you know, maybe all the way through, and then the next next one you listen to the next day. But uh, I'm looking forward to actually hearing that off vinyl, and uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, I've had some reports from friends who've done that, and and they've they've been really saying great things about it. So I'm looking forward to that. Great. Um, is it okay if we get you to touch on my favorite song off the new album? Sure, absolutely. What were the musical compositions behind the song We Are Immortal? We Are Immortal is uh, the part of the story where the story starts off sort of uh, talking about, you know, these angels visiting the earth and and um, destruction is is headed on the earth, is, is heading towards the earth. And it sort of sets the tone for the rest. And then you have the rise of a global tyrant who is there to basically subjugate and enslave people. And there's a song called Wings of Steel after that. And that's where this tyrant goes through and kills all of his political enemies or as many as he can find. And so the song We Are Immortal is the part of the story after that, where there's most of the most of the resistance, most of the people that are going against this tyrant uh, have been killed. But there is a remnant that has survived. And there's then there it's a song of hope and it's a song of resistance and it's a song saying, you know, hey, even if we die, we're, we'll come back again. You can't kill us. We're immortal. And it's it's really a fight song. I mean, it's really, if I had to say, like, you know, what what it encapsulates, it's it's more of like a, a spirit of resistance. You know, you've got this bad uh, individual uh, trying to impose his will by force, you know, on a global scale. And then there's, a, there's you know, obviously going to be a pushback. And these are the, the people that are trying to fight back. Who are the band's musical influences? Well, I think in the early days, certainly bands like Iron Maiden and Judas Priest and uh, even maybe Queensryche a little bit. Uh, they were from Seattle and they were just a little bit before Fifth Angel. And we saw what happened with them and, and uh, we knew some of the guys in the band. And uh, so, you know, we tried to kind of emulate what they did in terms of not musically, but in terms of business wise, what they did. Uh, but I'd say as far as influences, I'd say those are probably the big ones. It'd probably be like Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, you know, more power metal. You know, we were sort of in that power metal scene, and that's that's sort of where our roots are. So, so in other words, if you have listeners and they don't like melodic power metal, then Fifth Angel is probably not the band for you. <laughs> I like to say that up front because... You know, it's like if you love power metal and you love melodic music with, you know, where there's actual vocals and the choruses are are really easy to sing along with, then this will you'll love this album. And if that's not your, you know, if that's not your cup of tea, then then this is not your record. <laughs> I understand. Yeah, I'm into everything from old school Sabbath all the way up to death metal stuff like Deicide. Uh, oh, you know what? There are a couple of bands I could mention that I forgot to mention. You know, pro probably and when you talk about Black Sabbath, there's a little bit of an influence there, but also Dio, I think, was a big influence on us. Uh, some of those records were were uh, influential. And you know, when you talk about Black Sabbath with Dio, uh, you know, songs like The Mob Rules and Neon Nights and all those kinds of things, those are uh, those are songs from our childhood as well. So you know, those definitely had an influence too. I'm sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, good. TV Crimes is another good one that I like by Sabbath. I'm sorry? TV Crimes is another good one I like by Black Sabbath. Right. Yeah. For this next question, does the band have any band gear endorsements? Uh, yeah, I, I actually use Pearl and um, Sabian and Aquarian and Vader and uh, a small company called Stick Grips. Um, I'm not sure who the guitar players uh, are endorsed by, but um, there are a lot of different endorsements. If you need that information, I can have that sent to you. All good. You answered that question really well, man. This next one's also a good one. Please give us some drum tips or advice for starting out drummers. 
Well, I think for, you know, as a drummer, you have to, you know, recognize what your role is in the band and, you know, you're really the timekeeper and you're really, you know, kind of the energy of the band to some degree. It's sort of like you're the engine in the car or you're the foundation of the house and you have to be very solid and you have to be very aggressive and you have to be, uh, you know, you have to give the basis of that power or whatever type of drumming it is. You know, maybe you're in a jazz band and power is really not what it's about. Maybe it's more about finesse. But you have to decide what kind of style of music that you're in, and then you have to be a drummer that fits the music. Um, I think one of the best pieces of advice I can give is, you know, you are there to serve the songs, not vice versa. You know, the songs aren't there to serve you. You're the you're the drummer. You're there to lay the foundation and, and enhance it. And certainly, you know, some of my favorite drummers are guys like Buddy Rich and Neil Peart and. Um, John Bonham, you know, those are probably my three biggest influences. There's a lot of other influences too, but one thing that I learned from Neil Peart is to, you know, try to orchestrate your parts because drums can be almost an orchestra unto themselves. You know, they're not just uh, a, a, a musical instrument that doesn't hit notes. I mean, you can actually create parts that enhance the musical compositions. And so uh, that would that would be my advice. Right on. This next one might get you on a little bit of a rant. Please give some advice to bands to help them better promote themselves. Yeah, I'm not sure it's going to really create a rant. I mean, in this day and age, it's it's really tough. I think it's tough because, you know, when we started out in the business, there were certain barriers to the marketplace. You had to have a record deal because if you didn't have a record come out, nobody would know about you. And nowadays, everybody can put out a record. Everybody can be on Spotify. Everybody can be on YouTube. Um, so I, I do think in terms of promoting yourself, um, as far as advice, I mean, I, I just think that if you love music and you have to do it, then do it with all your heart. You know, do it with all your might. Do everything you can to succeed. Do everything you can to enhance your audience and enhance the base for your art. You know, I think I think that that's that's important. My other advice is if you don't really love music and it's not something like you can't live without it, you know, if it's not if it's not that type of thing in your life, then don't do it <laughs> because it's a it's a very different industry than it was when I was growing up in it. And uh, I, I think right now it's it's getting a little bit crazy. You know, like we've all had our royalties impacted by streaming services and you know, I'm just not a big fan of what the industry is right now in terms of of its revenue for the artists. It's a very difficult time for new artists. Um, so, yeah, if you love it and you can't do anything else, then do everything you can and win the digital war if you can. You know, I think it's really geared a little bit more towards younger bands, but social media, YouTube, you know, all of these things are very important for promotion uh, nowadays and they tend to favor younger artists. So. You know, I, I just think you have to be, you know, sold out to, to, you know, to to just realizing that I'm going to have to engage in that. And if you don't want to engage in that, you know, that's really the music business now is, is social networking, YouTube, digital streaming services. That's really where the business is. I see, man. This next one is a real good one. Who was your big time influence that got you started into drumming musically? Well, um, I mentioned them, but I'll say I'll say them again. I mean, I actually had a lot of different drumming influences. Uh, originally, I was just doing rudimental drumming, and then I had a, a great drum teacher that um, taught me about jazz greats like Buddy Rich and Louis Belson and Latin music and fusion bands like Yes and Return to Forever. I mean, uh, and then I discovered Rush. Um, but certainly, uh, as far as... Uh, you know, the drummers that were the most influential influential to me, I think I've mentioned, um, you know, Buddy Rich, Neil Peart, John Bonham, and they're all, you know, they're, they're three completely different drummers, but I tried to, in my drumming, I tried to really, like, combine those guys, and, you know, take those three guys and put some of the best aspects into my drumming. So, uh, you know, that's, those are, those are my biggest influences. I've also been influenced by uh, drummers like Steve Gadd and Simon Phillips and Tommy Aldridge and you know there's just so many great players out there. I mean you can you can you can look at things now. You can go to Instagram and find so many great players. So um, there's there's always great influences and 
uh, great players to be influenced by. And, you know, that's the whole thing. You have to find a drummer or drummers that really speak to your heart and really speak to what you are trying to create musically. And then, you know, you can certainly learn a lot. But, you know, at some point you do have to develop your own style as well. I understand. Yeah, man. And three of my favorite drums that got you know, me into music in general uh, is the drummer for Morbid Angel, the first one, Pete Sandoval. I am also into uh, Steve Ajim. And the last one was the drummer from Divine Heresy, Tim Young. Okay. They were cool drummers for me. And I also love your drumming as well. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate the kind words. That leaves us with five more for the interview and then we are to the station ids okay what social media outlets can the band be reached on uh pretty much everything instagram facebook uh youtube the only thing that we're not on is uh, like we don't spend a lot of time on TikTok, <clears throat> just because it's really geared towards you know very much towards younger people and obviously we're we're not young <laughs> we're we're older guys, you know, that have been doing this for a while. So um, that's not really our format. What are the band's immediate music career goals? Uh, I, I didn't understand the question. What part? Uh, say what again? are the band's immediate music career goals? Well, I think for us, you know, we've been in the business for a long time. Obviously, we just played Germany. We played the Keep It True Festival, and it's always fantastic, you know, just meeting some of your fans and signing things and conversing with them and hanging out with them. And we had a great time doing that. Uh, so anytime we have an opportunity to do that, we're going to do that. Um, we're looking to try to uh, enhance what we're doing. Uh, we, we understand today we just got word that the album is – top 50 in Germany on the national charts, which is not a small thing for a metal band because that's all of the, you know, that's everything. That's EDM is on there. Pop is on there. Rap is on there. All kinds of music is on there and we're number 50 today. And so we're, we're kind of excited about that. Um, and, but we certainly want to spend as much time as we can uh, getting to know our fans. So, so we're looking forward to touring in Europe, uh, hopefully in the fall. And if not in the fall, then hopefully the spring. Okay, cool. When you get on tour, hopefully you come to Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, eventually for a show, man. That would be great. I've played Manitoba before with Alice Cooper, so, you know, I, I, I toured Jan, uh, actually toured Canada one time in January, which was uh, quite the experience. I'm not sure I would necessarily recommend it to anybody. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, sir, beautiful country that you have there. Yeah. What are some of your favorite moments when on tour? Well, my favorite moment on tour is, uh, you know, just that moment, you know, that you're just about ready to go on stage and usually the lights will kind of go down and all of a sudden the crowd will just, you know, roar. And, and it's just that it's like, it's like getting a shot of adrenaline into your arm. I mean, it's just like such a compelling uh, experience and can kind of addictive. It's almost like a drug, you know, like where you, you hear this thing and, and it just, just motivates you to go out there and just kick butt. So, you know, I, I think that that's, that's my favorite moment uh, in music in general is just the moments right before hitting the stage. It's, it's kind of a magical time. Okay. And this one's going to be a bit of a twist and turn, but what are some of your favorite moments when in the studio? In the studio, I think my favorite moment is when you do something that, you know, you, you're, you're trying to do something that maybe is just at the edge of your abilities and you can just barely play it, but you nail it and you execute it perfectly and you walk back into the control room and you listen to it and it's a great take and you're happy with it. Um, that there's a great satisfaction that comes with challenging yourself to do something and push your push the envelope of what you're comfortable with and then actually actually doing it and being able to listen back it's a very gratifying experience right on and now for the last question of the interview and then we'll need the station ids from you okay what new band news do you have on the fifth angel front as in anything we haven't covered so far in this interview 
Uh, band news. Um, there's really not a lot of band news. I mean, just what I just mentioned, you know, we just found out today that the album went top 50 in, in Germany, which is, again, kind of a big deal for us. We haven't been really been on the German charts before. Um, actually, I, we might have been on Third Secret, but I'm not sure what the chart position was. But, uh, you know, we just want to, one thing we always want to do is we want to, at every, at the end of every interview, is just thank our fans that have followed us for years and years. And, uh, support us in what we're doing. Um, we obviously wouldn't be able to do this without them. So we just wanted to always say thank you very much for following us. Right on. Cool. Thank you very much for your time in this interview today for Mangled Music Radio and Craig's Metal Storm. I also need the station IDs now. Okay. Did you say one is, what was it? Mangled what? Music Radio. Okay. All right. You ready? Yeah, ready when you are. Hi, this is Ken Mary from Fifth Angel, and you're listening to Craig's Metal Storm. Check it out. That's is the first no station ID, which is good. And was the second one's for Mangled Music Radio. Uh, were, was there too much noise going on on the last one, or was it okay? No, the, the last station ID I felt came through fine. Okay, we'll try this one. Hi, this is Ken Mary with Fifth Angel, and you're listening to Mangled Music Radio. Get mangled. Cool. Thank you very much for your time, and thank you very much for the interview, Ken. Thank you so much. You have a, a, a great. Uh, what is it? What time is it there? Three thirty, almost. Well, you have a great afternoon. Yeah, you have yourself a great rest of your day as well. All right. Thanks, my friend. We'll set up for another interview again when uh, your label gives me another opportunity, buddy. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Bye. You too. Bye bye.